Welcome everyone to ins and outs of advising at Plymouth State. Uh, I'm Matt Cheney, Director of Interdisciplinary Studies and the current Chair of the Academic Affairs Committee, which oversees advising at Plymouth State. And this is Kelsey Donnelly. And I am the Assistant Director of Advising. And Matt and I have been doing this session for a few years now. It's one of the highlights of my year. So I hope it just comes for you as it is. Though today is a special <laughs> one because we decided to change things up a little bit. We realized that the uh, presentation we've been doing for some years now is, is a little stale and out of date. And there are different things that we need um, now for where we're advising is at Plum State. So if we're a little clunky, it's only because we're um, doing some of this stuff for the very first time. We do have a slide prepared, which I know Matt's going to share shortly. We're only going to hit on some of them. We're going to hit on the ones in the beginning. There is a lot more to the slides that we're not going to share. They are very content heavy, but that's by design because we want people to be able to go in and get some like idea starters, like looking at the slides, but we're not going to go over all of them because we really do want to show you the specific tools that we use and how, what our advising process is. And the full slideshow will be available on the CoLab website soon after uh, this presentation. And I apologize in advance if I am looking at the screen and it doesn't look like I'm looking at you. That's because the owl is in front of me and it feels awkward <laughs> to not look at you. <laughs> All right. So first off, one of the biggest questions we get is how do students find their advisor and their schedule? This can be harder than it seems. It can now. Things have changed. We recently went through an upgrade. So we went from banner eight to banner nine. With that, the process that we use to go look up our advisees has changed. It's also changed on the student side too, on how they can go look up their advisors and their schedules. So the students, there's three ways that they can look up their advisor. Like one, probably one of the easiest is to download the Navigate app. It is super easy. You can see who your advisor is. If their advisor has Navigate set up to make appointments, they can go right on there, make an appointment with the advisor. It's pretty easy. If anyone ever needs help setting that up, let me know. One um, thing to know about it though, is that faculty don't have access to the app itself. So yeah. only students have access to that. So if you want to see the Navigate app, you have to find a student. <laughs> right. So there is, I did put the process on there on how students can get the Navigate app. If you want to screenshot that, um, feel free. The students find it quite useful. And I just recently actually signed up for a class. So it was a little hack. So now I have access to the Navigate app. And it's awesome. It's really cool. It has, I guess I'll just go off on a little tangent. Like the Navigate <laughs> app for students has their classes, it has their advisor, it has like for first year like incoming students, it has like this little GPS tracker. So if students don't know how to get to their class, uh, like you, it will walk you to a class. It's really cool. There's yeah. like study buddies if students are looking to study with students in their class that shows them other students looking to study. I don't know. It's, it's pretty great. <laughs> Another way students can find their advisor is degree works. That's a common one. And then also on my Plymouth with this new banner upgrade, the my Plymouth, like the student academic record and registration tab has a significant amount of information. Students can see their schedules, they can link directly to degree work. It's it's really cool. So if you haven't, this is what you see is pretty much what students see as well in the advising tab. So students will go to the student. But on my Plymouth, advisors will click on, you know, services and then the advisor tab. And similarly with the schedule. Um, in the now, and they also can see their schedule and navigate out. Um, and can we see their schedule when we go to the navigate website? Trying to remember. Yes. I think so. Yeah. 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 Advisors can. Advisors. Great. Now, finding lists of your advisees, there's an easy way and a hard way. We'll yeah. give you both. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you both. So again, we're going to go over these on the slides real quick, but we're going to actually sure. show you this um, once we switch off of the slides. 
But to get your advisory list, again, you can do it in Navigate. You sign into Navigate and your it will show a staff view and your advisee list shows right there. And you can export that list and you can email right from that list. You can text right from that list. That is how 90% of the time I access my students. Um, yeah, Navigate makes it pretty easy. That's the easy way. If you prefer the hard way. There is, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say hard. It is harder, but like we just use it for different things. scenarios. So to get your banner advisee, your advisee list from banner, you're going to, like I just described, you're going to go to my phone of services and to the advising button. And you're going to go view my advisee listing. This box popped up. When it first popped up, you're going to get a list of all advisees you've ever been attached to. So great job for <laughs> supporting all of those students. But also we know that's probably not super helpful during advising weeks when you really just want to connect with your active students who need their pins right now. So we discovered these filters help. And I, I will say them, you probably want to screenshot this as well. If you make the filters, the student status equals active. Active is important because right now it's pulling past students and you just want active ones. You also need another line to make sure that you're pulling the primary advisor. There is a, um, you could also choose secondary advisor as well, but you need to make sure that you have primary is true. And then the advisor type does not equal past academic advisor. So if you can have those three lines of filters, you will get your current advisee list. Um, you are able to export that list. If you click on the settings icon on the top right, there's a screenshot of that. And then you're gonna hit export, export advising listing. It's great, you can export it, it doesn't have emails yet, uh, so I need to look into how to get those to include. And I am not sure until Friday when pins come out, if pins are going to be exported with that or not. So that'll be a surprise for all of us. If you can, it'll be really <laughs> useful. I'm, I might use it. I've never used it in this way of getting to advisees, but if it includes pins, that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, we will send out pins. Um, we will make sure that you have access to your pins and a list so you can see all of your advisees and a list. And so, something we discovered last time is not everybody knows what pins are. We have some new advisors here. Very um, so what are pins, Kelsey? Pins are your personal identification number. There is a specific number each student needs in order to log into the registration system to register. So each student needs their own pin in order to register. Advisors hold those pins, so you become pretty important. It is often the, the one thing that gets students to go to their advisor is yeah. they can't register without their pin. Mm -hmm. All right, so getting to the registration system uh, is a little different for students and, and faculty, although not that different. No, it's not. No. It's actually pretty similar. I will say this slide has a, um, a list on how students can go find the registration but we've discovered a way that students and advisors can find the registration system. This slide um, is out of date. It yeah. is, that we just found out about. <laughs> yes. but if, and, we're, and we're gonna show you this when we go off slides, but Don't on my <laughs> Plymouth, there is a link on the services, there's a link to the registrar's office. And the registrar's office has done an incredible job and they now have a button that says register for classes. So you can see the registration system, the students can see the registration system super helpful because up until recently, advisors only had access to course search and right. they hadn't been able to get in to the way that students actually go in and register. So now we're going to be able to show you a snapshot of mm -hmm. what students see. We'll do that in a moment. Before that, though, we should go over the schedule of advising. Now, may I, I should... may I ask a question? Sure. I, I put my hand up. Sorry, I barged in. I wanted to ask about pins, if I could. Um, sure. We've had various policies on how advisors should use pins, and Matt kind of referred or implied that it's the you know it is a, a good way to get students to come to you. But 
you know, there has been some discussion about, you know, advisors who just send out their pins to everyone without using that technique. And uh, I know some people have been admonished for doing that, right? So what is current policy so far as you know it regarding our use as advisors of the PIN? There is not policy on it, as far as I know. Um, there is what we would say is better practice, uh, which is that because the whole reason that we've set the pins uh, is to encourage students to contact their advisor and have a conversation with their advisor. We have talked about getting rid of pins altogether. The advising task force seriously looked at recommending getting rid of pins. Um, it would certainly make the registrar's job a lot easier. But we ultimately decided not to recommend that because so many faculty do use it as a way to um, especially get students who have not contacted them recently to, uh, to, to sort of force them to have to contact their advisor. So there is nothing prohibiting advisors from just sending out pins. Um, please don't send out pins for students who are not your advisees. Um, there isn't policy prohibiting that, but uh, I think most advisors are trying to use the pins as a way to, to wrangle students. And we wouldn't get pins for students who aren't our advisees unless we were some kind of skilled hacker, correct? You don't have to be especially skilled. Um, okay. They're there. Uh, I, and also in this term, in fact, we may be getting them from everybody because of staffing problems that it's, it's hugely arduous for the um, academic and career advising to send out the individualized pins for every single major and they're about to lose a staff member. So I think that what we're probably gonna get this term is um, pretty much all the pins. Uh, um, other, and if, uh, I, uh, if I could just follow up, what is the half-life of the pin for this session? In other words, how long will students need pins and when will they no longer need pins in the registration cycle going through ad drop for that's long. a perfect segue to what we are about to talk about. Sorry. <laughs> you're, like, exactly. you're like a plant, Elliot. Nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because now we really need to talk about the schedule and the schedule includes when students need pins and when they don't and what pins will do. Um, so I do have one caveat before we begin, which is that we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty that you don't necessarily need as an advisor. Um, you're going to get the information of your students and their PIN and the day that they can uh, they can begin registration. And if that's all you want to pay attention to, you can. We're going to tell you some of the logic behind and the system behind uh, where those dates come from. So advising weeks are coming up. We have two weeks of advising weeks. Uh, this is time, students can't register during this time, but this is a time to talk with students about their six week grades, how they're, uh, if they need to take any second semester courses, if they aren't already, although add drop for that ends very soon. So uh, that's not actually going to be possible for long. It is some terms. Um, going over classes for next semester, getting them their pins, checking on how things are going for them overall, uh, and tracking who plans to transfer or withdraw. We'll show you some ways that you can report if a student tells you that they plan to leave from the state. That is good information for particularly frost tests. Uh, to have. They like to know that. So at the very least, they can try to do something of an exit interview and find out why students are leaving. Um, I think we're going to skip the pins and go to registration process. Well, actually, I can. I think I can address Elliot's question with the pin. So we do, all students do get pins. They last, you need them to initially register. Students need that pin to go in and start the registration process. The registrar's office does a great job. If a student has gone in and started the registration process, I think like every few days they remove the PIN requirements. So if a student has already initiated the registration process, they won't need a PIN moving forward. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry. That's the plan. If, she, if it's working right, students only need their PIN once. Uh, and once they initiate registration, even if they only register for one course, they should only need that pin once between now and add drop in September. Right. And if they haven't met with their advisor, they won't have their pin, so they won't be able to register. Um, right. But they do get new pins each semester, each registration session. But if they don't register 
now and they wait till say June, as they sometimes do, they will still need their pin. Um, so a pin is sort of the, the key that gets you into the system. Uh, but once you're in, you're in. Mm -hmm. And may I ask a follow-up and I'm sorry to go on with no, the great. But for new students, like those enrolling uh, first year students who we're gonna see, I guess, beginning in May and, and June, are there going to be pins for them or is it an open enrollment process? How's that gonna work? They also receive pins. It's usually one pin for all incoming. So it's a universal pin that first semester, but they do receive the pin. Um, so they, they know it in ahead of time. So when incoming students start to register, they will have the option to go in and do it on their own or to work with their advisor or someone in the career and academic advising center. We are going to have sessions up and running so students can just drop in and get some registration help if needed. Thank you. You're welcome. So registration for most of our, our current students will begin on April 10th at 7 a.m. Uh, for the students for whom that's uh, that day is open. Then new and incoming transfer students begin in late April and new incoming students uh, start to register in late May. This is uh, worth knowing just in case students are dragging their feet and wondering when courses are gonna begin to fill up. Uh, as this progresses, more and more courses fill up. This is the real detail. Um, so here's how students' registration dates are determined. Uh, on the very first day, Monday, April 10th, through the Friday of that week at 4.30, athletes, presidents, and deans list students based on their fall 2022 grades who have 60 or more earned credits. That's earned credits, not credits that are still in progress that ter this term. And all students who are registered with Campus Accessibility Services will be able to register on that Monday. So a big group, but a specific group. Then that Tuesday, it's all students with 60 or more earned credits. Again, earned credits is the key there. Students often don't know that, and they will think that their current in-progress courses count uh, toward that and will wonder why they're not able to register the first week. The second week, all the previous ones close, except I think for accessibility. I think accessibility always stays open. It does not. It does not. It is wrong. just that week. So accessibility students are only that first week. Yeah, so it is very important that if you do have students that you work with that use services and campus accessibility services that they are aware in advance that they have that early deadline. Or else they'll be shut out for two weeks. They will. So the next week is students with, uh, with up to 60. Oh no, sorry. Uh, I've, the next week is students with less than 60 earned credits. So again, the Monday is special for students on presidents and deans lists. Then Tuesday opens up to everybody with 60 or fewer earned credits. Key thing is that the folks from the first week will be turned off. They will not be able to register for two more weeks. Um, because after that second week is our problem solving week. Problem solving week is a, an innovation we came up with because we realized that there were lots of students who discover when they go to register that something is preventing them from registering. For instance, financial holds. Uh, that's probably the biggest one. And so problem solving week was created as a way to give everybody an equal opportunity to solve any challenges that come up during registration week. Uh, so registration is turned off for everybody, not a, nobody whatsoever can register during problem solving week um, as a way to give students the equal opportunity to get classes once they've solved their problems, um, which generally are financial holds. And for advisors, the best thing to do is student will say, I can't register, I have a financial hold. Best thing to tell them is to contact student financial services. There are a million different reasons a student could have a financial hold. Uh, and only student financial services has access to that information. Yeah, and I will say the reason why we did go to this registration model is because we were finding that students were waiting a really long time to register. They weren't registering on their registration day. 
and we spent a lot of time chasing. So we found that if we gave a deadline, you have to register within this week, registration picked up and we're chasing a lot less people. And we're better able to schedule classes because we know how many students roughly are going to be in them. So we're finding fewer classes are getting canceled for low enrollment because students are just waiting to, to register for them. Mm -hmm. Elliot, did I see your hand up? Yes. Yes, sorry, it's me again. <laughs> You're That's only okay. out. Um, I Can you just review for me the rationale for the 7 a.m.? I know you've struggled with this as well as I have. Um, on registration day, I do get emails, calls at 7.05, 7.15, and there's nowhere I can go to get answers. And I feel like, it's kind of dead time and it just adds stress until that 8 a.m. or whatever, if you're available to work on it right then. So explain explain the rationale for the 7 a.m. And I know not everyone likes it. So <laughs> no, thank you. It is really, it's a good, it's a good thing to clarify. A lot of students have 7 a.m. 8 a.m. classes, and we don't want them to feel like they have to skip class in order to register. So we do open it an hour earlier so students who might have those earlier classes have the opportunity to get into it. No one has classes, so everybody has equal opportunity to get into the classes. I know in our office, we do offer drop-in advising. We have for years, like starting at 7, so as soon we as, do. yeah, we do. So if students are having issues at 7, um, they can pop on. Like we have an open Zoom and like a bunch of us like help monitor it so yeah that is something we do offer that's great i didn't know that and that's, that's something we can put in our communications to advisees too uh, is that if you run into problems at 7 a.m right don't contact me i'm not awake it has you know when the first day of registration it decides not to work and everybody's yes. freaking out that's a lot to navigate but usually it's not that hectic and we can get those one and two. Because that is a real thing. The banner really likes to um, go down at exactly yeah. the worst times. Yeah. <laughs> or no Wi-Fi. It has been. Right. Well, we've lost Wi-Fi. We've lost banner. <laughs> yeah. First day of registration is always exciting. It is. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please do. Um, in terms of the holds that students are likely to encounter that end up, um, you know, being the that thing that they're dealing with at seven o'clock in the morning and not knowing where to go, um, is it possible for us in our advising meetings to alert them to those holds ahead of time? I know like some holds we can see and some we can't. Is it is there advice we can give them so that they can be aware of those holds ahead of time? Most of them show up on degree works. We okay. have, we're, I'm not sure what SFS's position on it now is. We have frequently, frequently asked them, please, can you just send advisors a list of the holds your advisees have before registration starts? They, for various reasons, have not wanted to do this. One of which is that they say it changes, it's in flux so often right, yeah. that any, any list they send out is basically out of date, um, yeah. I mean, out of date the minute they send it. Yeah. Um, so they have always recommended if you want to see who has holds, it is up to up to date on degree works. On degree you can works. also do that individual student by individual student. But we can at least advise them to check degree check work degree right works. up until registration. And if like so, like the Friday before, if they're seeing a hold, they should try and track that down and take care of it before Monday or Tuesday. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, that is, I mean, student financial services has been incredible. We have like drastically been able to do a lot more than yeah. we have in the past, especially around holds. So I will reach out to them to see if there is some sort of report that we can okay. distribute around. Great. Thank so, you. Welcome. All right. So we like to think of advising beyond just giving students their pens and helping them figure out what to register for, that holistic advising is a real thing and an important thing, especially as we're thinking about retention and helping students develop a feeling of belonging on campus. Um, so in advising, it's helpful if you can and are comfortable doing so to think about all aspects of the student's life. Uh, and 
con and have a conversation with them about this um, as best you can. How is their physical, social, emotional, and mental well-being? How are they doing? Um, how are they feeling in their academic progress? What are they thinking about for life after Plymouth State? What sort of challenges and successes are they experiencing and how involved are they on campus? We know, especially for retention purposes, um, involvement in clubs and uh, student organizations is a huge one for a sense of belonging. Uh, this doesn't mean you have to be an expert in it. I often like, I am very much not a social worker. Uh, and so I try to think of myself as more a referral agent for my advisees because rather than them having to run around campus for in 10 different ways to try to find an answer to something, if I can at least try to help them know the best strategy for finding an answer if they're having a challenge with something, that's sort of how I think of myself as their advisor. Um, and we'll show you some great resources for, for figuring this stuff out because there are all sorts of resources available on campus that none of us have memorized. Um, but helping to build confidence in our students, offering them encouragement, helping them build a relationship with us and with the institution. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why PIN still exists. We really want students to get connected with the people on this campus just so they know they have a go-to. So this is, I know advising weeks are crazy busy and we see a lot of students in a short amount of time, but like if we can get a little deeper into their lives more than just, oh, these are the classes, here's your PIN, you're good to go. I think that really helps a student feel more connected here. But not everybody's comfortable with this. So this is one of my favorite slides that Kelsey created, which is conversation starters. How do you, how do, you do this even within the short span of a quick advising meeting? Um, and some of these questions are really, really great. I'm not going to read them all because you can see them there. But being able to just start the student not with what courses do you want to register for this term, but rather how are you doing uh, can be really, really helpful. What's your favorite question on here, Kelsey? My favorite one, and I ask almost every single question, add this to every single student, is on a scale from one to 10, what's your experience with CSU so far? And a lot of students will say, oh, a seven or an eight. And then my follow-up question is, what would make it a 10? And that kind of gets at what is might not be going the best. And it'll also tell me, they'll also like usually go into what's going great. So if they say, oh, it's a seven, I'm not really meeting anybody, then I know I can, I'm like, let me show you this student org list and maybe we can get them attached to a club or it, it just prompts further conversations. Mm -hmm. Another one I've started asking, and I, in, you know, when I first started advising, I didn't know this was like, this should be, I just dropped my water bottle. <laughs> this should be a question I ask, but I ask, are you eating? Mm. Keep getting answers that are surprising. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you feel comfortable like digging deep into like how they're really doing on campus. That is one that often. It's remarkable. Some of the there are lots of reasons why a student may not be eating. The ones that have really blown my mind have not have been students who just have never had to think about their own schedule of everyday life before. Mm -hmm. Typically, our younger students. Um, and especially we're seeing this post-COVID, after the COVID emergencies, students are different and their skills are a bit different than they were before. And their, their challenges are certainly different than they were before. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding students who just have not figured out how to create a meal schedule for themselves is not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, like, I... I love this. Uh, I love these conversation starters. And like, I encourage anybody who feels like, like it's, a, it's kind of hard to delve a little deeper with a student. Um, I just want to like, put out there the power of just being like, hey, how's life? Because like, lots of times students are almost just like looking for someone who wants to talk to them about stuff. And like, even a simple conversation starter like that can open the floodgates. And like so many times when I've asked that question, they'll be like, you know, maybe they'll talk about like their difficulty in anatomy and physiology, but then they'll start being like, and my roommate, like we're having these issues and it's just like so hard to focus on school while I'm doing this. And, you know, I got a sports injury and that's really like set me back a ton. And so like, don't discount the power of like a simple 
really casual conversation starter and like a warm welcoming like affect to really open some floodgates and um help them just like talk through some stuff and you don't have to have all the answers but sometimes just like a listening ear is like exactly what they need at that moment in time absolutely yeah definitely making students know that they are appreciated it's just yeah happy. and that we're all humans and we just want to see what how how things are going for them at the at the core of it all right i think here we can skip to um yeah so here's where we're gonna stop and we're gonna show like um but there is like there is a lot more in those slides that are pretty yes. helpful so i do once we post it do recommend everybody going in and taking a look martha your hand is up sorry that's because i forgot to put it down i'm good <laughs> <laughs> well it was a good transition as i was moving to the other uh to another screen. so thank you for that you need transition music <laughs> so something we thought that it would be useful for us to talk about is workflow as an advisor. So students made an appointment with you, they show up, what do you do next? Because we have a lot of tools and navigating those tools, not to use a pun, uh, <laughs> uh, navigating those tools can be really challenging because there's so many different stuff. And it feels like in the last five years, yet more and more tools have been thrown at us with good intentions of making it easier, but it's actually made it even more overwhelming to be an advisor. So what Kelsey and I are going to do is show you our process, um, which are somewhat different because we have different types of advisees. Um, our process when we start out a uh, an advising meeting, and then we're going to show you some of the neat things that individual tools do. So I'm going to share my screen just from where I open up. So I'm using Firefox. You can do what I'm about to show you. You can do the same thing in Chrome with a slightly different, um, in a slightly different way. So I have a folder for all my PSU stuff, and I have up top a folder for advising. You'll see in in Chrome in uh, Firefox, I can just click open all tabs, and all of these things that I have handily bookmarked will show up. Um, you can do this in. Chrome as well, um, just by right clicking on uh, a folder if you have an advising folder or any type of folder. So the things I have put in there are um, EAB Navigate, DegreeWorks, uh, an IDS specific thing uh, that we use uh, for advising worksheets. And then these neat little things, which we now have access to, which one is an advisee search that will take you to um, a very specific page for your advisee. I, I'm not gonna show you, we're not gonna show you any specific student stuff because of FERPA. We don't wanna be causing massive FERPA violations here. So um, we're not going to show you any specific students, um, but know that this is a great tool you can play with and we'll show you how to get there uh, momentarily. And then finally, I have our uh, the course search, which we'll also show you how to get to um, both very easy to access from the registrar's office webpage. Matt, I'm smiling so big because I also open almost every single one of these links for each advising appointment, but I did it manually. I would go in, then I would open each one. I didn't know that this existed. So thank you. Yeah. Advising hacks right just, there. Just put the, <laughs> the links you need for advising into a single folder and then just have your browser open that folder. Can I have a, ask you a quick question, Matt? Um, do you have to sign in to like my Plymouth first in order for these links to like work when you open them? No, because it'll just take you to the single sign on page. Um, so I did sign on just before this session because right. I knew it was going to do that <laughs> to me. Um, but all it'll do is take you to the single sign on page and then you go right in. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, and the one thing we wanted to show on Degree Works is says a lot of people don't know. It can be a pain to look up a student's ID, um, but if you just click advanced search, you can you can go on their name. DegreeWorks is great too. So I'm I'm going to just like hop in on my process because it's so yep. similar to as soon as a student comes, we'll do the initial like, how are things going? Like, how can I help? And then we'll go in. And the first thing we open is DegreeWorks. I give them a copy of their four-year plan so I can show you where to find we have draft four-year plans that you can update for your program, but they I'll hand that to the students, and then we'll open up the degree work. Then we'll check off 
what they've completed. And you can see in DegreeWorks, I don't really use it for this, but you can, you can see what classes are available in the fall. And like, you can just click on the course and it will show you the course availability for that specific course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to start with DegreeWorks just because it gives me a full overview of where the student's at. And then we do have an advising worksheet in IDS that's specific to our program that we use. Um, okay, why don't we show mindfulness then? Yeah, let's go to mindfulness and we can show you how to get to these resources, how to utilize them a little bit. And it's thinking. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so since we start with degree works, how about we show you how to get to degree works? Yes. <laughs> I actually don't remember because I bookmarked it so long ago. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like it's changed. There is a few ways. One, you can go to like services and go to the advisor tab, and then degree works is on the left. However, I want to show you another way that's going to pull into some other resources that you might want to utilize. Like, so I could just go to the you advisor. Could just tab. go to the advisor. However, I go to the advising tab. Advising tab up top, which is a great place. And I scroll down a little bit. And then I copy go slash degree works right there. You can't click on it. So this uh, is so, so one of the changes it? recently was with degree works, and I can't really access it, but if you copy it and <laughs> paste it into the link, it opens. Sorry, I have lots of. So, oh, you're right. So that's how I. That is there. so weird. <laughs> I don't know. I have tried to figure it out. This was one of our like problem, like solutions to a problem we were getting. We couldn't click on degree works, so mm -hmm. this was a way. Huh. This was I, why I was surprised that it worked when you bookmark it, marked it, Matt, because I have the same issue where I have it bookmarked, but when I go to it through a bookmark. It doesn't open it. <laughs> huh. I have to like copy and paste it into the actual address. Elliot's him. So go ahead, Elliot. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. This is excellent, by the way. Thanks for all the work you put into this. Um, in looking at the paths here, which I want you to continue with, in the back of my mind is what we have heard at Cabinet for a few months and about the new My Plymouth and new websites. And that's you know, it seems like they roll that out like on advising, first day of advising or, or first day of registration at the wrong time, right? So if you guys have a bead on when that's happening and if that is going to change what you're offering here. Hannah, you're on the committee, so I'm going to you. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I So right now... Um, the new My Plymouth has been rolled out in a very like skeletal state and they are completely aware that there is stuff that is missing and that's not going to like work for everybody right now, which is why they've rolled it out and they're seeking uh, folks feedback on like what is missing. I don't think there are any plans to roll out the new My Plymouth to replace the old My Plymouth, at least until the summertime. And then they, and even then they really do have plans for like a soft rollout where, where there's lots of opportunities to provide feedback for, um, you know, what's not working and what's missing. So I, I, they've actually done a really wonderful job of like having several, um, you know, stakeholders in those different working groups and meetings to provide that, um, kind of feedback about when is the best time to roll out, um, uh, new updates to to my Plymouth. I am not sure about the website. I have no idea about the website, but that is what I know about about the my Plymouth um, rollout as of now. Great. Thank you. Yeah. But if you do like the advising tab, it does not hurt when they're asking for feedback on the new my Plymouth to say, "Hey, keep the advising tab." Yeah. <laughs> we had to fight really hard just to get an advising tab. So. Yeah. I love the advising tab. It one, is my go-to. One thing that I highly recommend, I won't go off on a tangent, but um, it, it the link to the new My Plymouth has like a really easy form for feedback. And so if you have time at all to kind of take note of like what you're using often in 
the old Maya Plymouth um, and kind of using that to provide feedback to the folks that are making the new one to say, hey, I use these four links every single day. They really should be in the new My Plymouth. That is great feedback for them to get as they're kind of populating what that looks like. Um, Cause they're really trying to get rid of the bloat right. of, of the old My Plymouth while still keeping it like useful to all different the, all the different like parties that use it, faculty, staff, students, all of the different institutions. So it's an undertaking for sure. And they're really looking for that feedback. So that's great. Thank you. Okay. So, so what else should we look here, at here while we're here? Um, if you want to keep scrolling down, again, this is the advising tab, and this is what you see when you first click on it. If yep. you scroll down, um, we have made it easy for students and advisors to see what courses are available. So we have a button here that shows right now all open second half semester sections. It does pull through course search, which can take a little bit to load. So I see Matt has that. Yeah, like, I just started we'll, going because we'll that go takes background. a minute or two. Uh, but also we show all of the the directions courses and the connections courses, that is really helpful, especially in the summer when we're working with incoming students. It makes it easy for students just to see what available um, directions are available. Yeah, it's a great there. I don't know of a better way to find if you're just looking for, for instance, a quantitative reason connection, um, which can be it can be very important because students are like, I've got this one type of course I need to take. How do I find them? Mm -hmm. um, this is the best way I know. Of. And we will show you through the registration system how to look it up. But sometimes yeah. this is easy because it shows the descriptions in one list where in the registration system, you have to like click on each class to see the description. So that's right. just something. So, so it seems to have loaded. So here, for instance, is what you get when you click on second half courses. Uh, it gives you the list of them. Yeah. All that are open. A bunch yeah. of great stuff. And we're not going to go into all of the resources, but if you can select academic advising, I'll talk about a few. The first one is the advising information notebook. This is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am such a OneNote advocate. It has organized and streamlined my life mm. so much. So if you aren't in OneNote, get there. It is, <laughs> I don't know, it just But you don't have to be in OneNote to use this. It'll open for Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, as PSU employees, we have access and students. But this is, a lot of the times I'll be emailing the students and they'll need information about like say parking. And I'll just go to this campus contact info, I'll copy the parking mm -hmm. and plug it into the email. Oh, you need to reach out to this person. It's just for me, it's a copy and place to put into emails. So I don't have to look up the contact information each time. Some additional information, this actually came from Scott and Megan in a sense, stolen right from them, plugged <laughs> right in here. So <laughs> yes, all the typical stuff that Students will ask advisors. Yeah. That's so great. And then, like, I have email templates. These are really just mine. I copy and paste them from here and I plug them into my email and I message it around the specific student I am emailing. But, like, I just found like I'm typing the same thing over and over and over. And this, uh, this gave me more time. What is SAP? This is actually a good thing for advisors to know about. So, satisfactory academic progress is something we often are not told about, but is a requirement for students with financial aid. It is. So I'll go into it briefly. SAP, Satisfactory Academic Progress, it's linked to your financial aid and like the federal government, if they're going to give you loans, they need to ensure that you are completing 67% of the classes that you're completed. And it's monitored. It, they monitor it over the summer. So like per year, you need to show that you're completing 67% of the classes that you've attempted that year. Um, so there's just a lot of information on here about it because I hear a lot that advisors don't necessarily know this process. So yeah. it's and you don't out. you know you don't need to know the details, but you will occasionally have a student who's like, I have to do this appeal thing for SAP. What is SAP? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so if you ever need to know, 
that information is here. And we're always looking to expand these resources. So if you as an advisor are looking for information on anything, let us know and we can easily throw it in there. That was the advising information notebook. Yep. And so another thing I'll show real quick, just because you're right there, is the course registration instructions. When I sit down with a student, I go over degree works and I go over the registration system and how to look up classes and I show them. But in case they forget every single thing we talked about when they leave my office, I also give them this. And I say, this is exactly what we just went over um, if you forget anything. So it's a resource to you as well. It is getting a facelift very shortly, but for now, all of the information, the important information is on it. That's great. And something while we're here to look at is minors. So we had a question about minors before. So um, really helpful here. And again, this is under the advising tab under academic advising. Um, we have the list of minors. We, Plymouth State has tons of minors, 70 or so, I think, uh, last I knew. Um, and so all of their, the various requirements for minors are here. Um, so for instance, neuroscience. See what the neuroscience minor requirements are and talk with a student about whether that can fit into their schedule. Another really important thing is the minor coordinators. Right now, I think this is the only place to get a list of the minor coordinators. I use this quite a bit. Um, our students do a lot of minors. Um, and I use this because it tells us who's authorized to sign the minor form. The minor form requires the signature of both the minor coordinator and of the advisor. So um, students often will come to me and say, who can sign this? And I do not have them all memorized. <laughs> um, so for instance, we're just in neurobiology. I would scroll down here, the neuroscience, and I know that's Chris Shabbat, Paul Fedorchik, David Zare, and Brian Healy are all authorized to sign, and Marcy can help uh, as the AOM. Exactly, and hopefully in the near future, this, the link to these coordinators will be on the minor's form, so yeah. if you're filling it out electronically, you'll just have a quick access to it. That is something that's in the process. And right above the Myers coordinators is the program coordinators, and that's who signs off on major change forms. So if you're ever looking for someone to sign off, or you're just trying to figure out who is it, who's the program coordinator for this major, yeah. um, here they all are. We really have just tried to create an ease for advisors. There's certain things that you use continuously and we just want to have like a quick access. So again, if there's something here that you don't see, um, reach out and let me know and we'll throw it on there. Okay. Great. So I think, how about, can we go to the registration system yes. now? So let's go back to my Plymouth. And right now we're going to show you how students are going to go in and register. This is how students can find it. There, there are, are a couple ways. There are a couple ways, yeah. yeah. This seems to be the easiest. It will probably change when my Plymouth changes, but for right now, as things stand, this is the most streamlined. So if you could select services. And scroll down a little bit and on the right hand side. You're going to see academic information and you see registrar's office, the big letters, registrar's office. Can you click on those big letters? And if you scroll down just a little bit, you can see register for classes on the top right. This is going to bring you to the registration system. Students, this is how students are going to go in and register. Right now, during pre registration, everybody only has access to browse classes. As advisors, you only ever have access to browse classes. But during the registration time that a student gets, like that specific date that they get, on that date, they're gonna select register for classes and enter in their pins. But for right now, we're all just browsing classes. So I wanna yep. show you very quickly how students can browse classes. So under subject, um, let's 
if we know a specific class. So I know the course ID for composition. So under subjects, can you please type in EN and scroll down to English EN and select that. Um, and then under the course number, I know that's 1400. So can you please put 1400 and then hit search. This is gonna pull up all of the sections for composition. Obviously we're only looking at spring 23 right now because fall 23 courses haven't opened yet, but when fall courses open, you'll select fall 23 and you'll see all of the availability for fall courses. Before you pop off of this, um, can you click on the title composition? If you click on competition, um, composition and hit course description, that's where you're going to see all of the specific topics for each class or to learn more about it. So you can close this. The good thing about this system is when students go in to start registering, they can see if a class automatically conflicts with something that they're already in. So it's really helpful. So they know that they won't do that top section because it conflicts with another class that they have. So they'll pick one that's open. Um, and if you hit search again, we use this page for if you know the, um, the course number. If you know the course ID, you're gonna use this page. But for courses that you don't necessarily know the course ID for, you're gonna scroll down to attributes. So I clicked advanced search to bring up more stuff. Yes, thank you. So and you go to advanced I'm search. I'm looking for attributes. Um, it's more towards Did the top. I, go, I went past the attributes. There and it it's right there. In the attribute box, can you hit the letter D? I'm specifically looking for directions courses right now. So I just streamline it. I hit the letter D and I'm gonna select create a thought direction. I'm gonna hit the letter D again. I'm gonna select past and present direction. I'm gonna hit the letter D again. Scientific inquiry direction. One more time, self and society. <laughs> now, before you hit search, can you please scroll all the way to the bottom? All the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom, there's this button called open sections only. When we're browsing classes right now during pre-reg, it doesn't necessarily matter so much because no one started registering, so everything is open. But during the registration period, students are starting to take some of those seats, so we really only want to see what courses are available. If you hit that button, yep. it will show search. that and hit search. And that's going to bring you a list of all of the directions courses their availability, their time. Again, to read more about it, you hit title and course description. Great. How to use this is also in that instructions um, that I showed you on the advising tab. Okay. So we are running low on time. So with that in mind, let's stop sharing. <laughs> Well, I want to see if we have any questions oh, okay. before we have five minutes left. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, um, so are there any questions or things that um, we haven't addressed yet that you would are burning to have answers to? So I will say if you have any questions about anything advising or if you want to learn the tools more, um, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and help get your process up and running. If you want to set availability up and navigate, students can register with you right through there, um, right through Navigate. Come see me. It's very fast. We can get you up and running pretty quickly. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's tempting to want to go delve into Navigate right now, but I think that that requires more than four minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. If you haven't checked out Navigate, I'll give you a quick overview. It's where you can see a complete list of all of your advisees. You can quickly email them. You can quickly text them. You can see their schedules. So it is a really great advising tool that it really makes advising a lot easier. Yeah. Navigate has become, I, I, have res, I will say I resisted Navigate for a while, but as it's been added more and more uh, tools within it, it has become invaluable to me as an advisor. Mm -hmm. So I think we might think about doing a specific session on Navigate yeah, soon, let's do it. Um, because I think it's worth it. Yeah. But really until then, uh, email Kelsey Donnelly if you want some personalized Navigate attention. All right, with that, I'm going to stop our recording, um, but do get in touch with us if you want to know any more. Thanks so much.